Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. So because I live under a rock, um, I was alerted recently about um, an Alexander the Great controversy happening over on the interwebs. All thanks to one of my subscribers. I want to say Zophie or Sophie. Thank you so much. So Netflix's latest drama documentary, Alexander, the Making of a God, has caused quite a ruckus online, which seems to be primarily motivated by the show's very early depiction of a romantic relationship between Alexander the Great and his confidant and friend Hephaestion. Greece's Minister for Culture, Lena Mendeni, criticised the show saying that it was a quote extremely poor quality fiction and quote low content rife with historical inaccuracies. Similarly, Demetrius, the president of the Christian Orthodox far-right political party Nikki, called the series quote deplorable unacceptable and unhistorical, and said it aimed to subliminally convey the notion that homosexuality was acceptable in ancient times, an element that has no basis. Okay, so these quotes present us with two quite significant questions to confront in this video. The first is that, is there truly no basis to the idea that homosexuality was acceptable in ancient times, as Demetrius claims? And secondly, is the depiction of Alexander and Hephaestion historically inaccurate and completely pure fiction? Well, before we get into all the details of this, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsor because this is going to be a bit of a long video. So thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. I have built all of my main websites over the past few years with Squarespace because I love how intuitive and easy it makes website design and layout. I don't know anything about coding, but that's not necessary with Squarespace because you simply drag and drop your content where you want it. Unlike all the other platforms that made it really frustrating because you put one code wrong and it all just blows apart, doesn't it? If you're a creator like me who wants to expand your revenue stream, then Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy for you to monetize your content and expertise in a way that fits your brand. Squarespace has a member area that lets you sell courses or online classes to followers, also has an inbuilt newsletter campaign option, and inbuilt analytics that show you where your audience is coming from, geography, time they spend on the site, and most popular content, etc. So if you want to expand your business or just build a beautiful website for your blogging leisure, then go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much, Squarespace, for making websites possible for everyone, and and now, thank you Squarespace for making websites possible for everyone and accessible for everyone. And thank you for sponsoring today's video. And now let's talk about Alexander the Great. So let's first start talking about queer culture in ancient Greece. Now, whilst it's very easy for me to use terms such as homosexual, gay or queer in this video as part of the discussion, we have to highlight first and foremost that modern dichotomization of homo and heterosexuality did not apply to the ancient world. So I'm going to take a leaf from Thomas K. Hubbard's book on homosexuality in Greece and Rome. He uses the term homosexual, gay and queer in the book, quote, not out of any conviction that a fundamental identity exists between ancient and modern practices or self-conceptions, but as a convenient shorthand linking together a range of different phenomena involving same gender, love and or sexual activity. Also important to note, because I'm talking about um, Alexander the Great in this video, I'm going to be talking mainly about male-on-male -male love interests in this video. I'm not going to touch on Sappho because that's a whole other concept entirely. So let's confront the first question. Taking into consideration that homosexuality was not a thing in the ancient world as we understand it, was homosexuality considered unacceptable in the ancient Greece as Demetrius claims it was? We can't anachronistically impose our conceptualizations of sexuality and desire upon the ancients as how they conceptualize attraction is very different to how we do now. But Hubbard's book covers a lot of the basis here. Highly recommended. I've linked it all down with all the resources in the description box. So if we're looking at textual discussions of same gender attraction, we have quite a few case studies to refer to. As Hubbard points out, some forms of sexual preference were considered a distinguishing characteristic of individuals. Hubbard notes that many texts regard such preferences as inborn qualities and thus essential aspects of human identity. The earliest philosophical account of male sexual passivity from the pre-Socratic philosopher Parmenides traces it to a failure of male and female seed to blend properly at a moment of conception. Interestingly, other medical writers consider effeminacy in men and masculinity in women to be genetically determined. Aristotle believed that the desire to be... Uh, now, how can I say this in a very um, YouTube-appropriate way? 
Aristotle believed that the desire to have a male within oneself as another male arose from a physiological deformity, I know, either a congenital defect or due to abuse as a child. Later, Aristological texts considered all manner of sexual preferences to be determined by the position of heavenly bodies at one's birth. Yet our earliest literary source of what we would classify as homosexuality was in the work of the iambic poet Archilochus in the early 7th century BCE, who spoke of men with different natures and therefore different sexual preferences. Later, Theognis wrote of boy love as a distinctive lifestyle not shared by all men, but he compares it favourably to the love of women. The early 5th century lyric poet Pindar contrasted men devoted to women with those who appreciated boys and generalised that different love tickles the fancies of different folks. If Demetrius is to argue that homosexuality as we would conceptualise it in the ancient world was not accepted in ancient Greece, we need to remind him of early Greek athletes who practiced in the nude, partly to showcase the beauty of young male bodies in motion, an aesthetic preference echoed further by Greeks' preference for male nudes in archaic and classical sculpture. Naturally, also the Palestra, the privately owned wrestling school, was a favourite gathering place for upper-class adolescent boys and their older admirers, and Pindar noted how athletic males were more attractive to both men and women of all ages, and also to deny the homosexual locus of the drunken culture that was the symposium is to deny all artistic representation saying otherwise. But did the ancient Greeks deem what we would class as homosexuality as unacceptable? Well, let's look at arguments for and against it, shall we? In his essay, Law, Society and Homosexuality in Classical Athens, David Cohen explains that, quote, distinctions between active and passive roles in male sexuality defined the contours of the permissible and impermissible in pederistic courtship and other forms of homoerotic behaviour. Among the Greeks, we are told, active homosexuality was regarded as perfectly natural, sexual desire was not distinguished according to its object. And there was, however, a prohibition against males of any age adopting a submissive role that was unworthy of a free citizen. So what was Cohen saying here? Well, what he's arguing is that homoeroticism in ancient Greece was not entirely straightforward, pun intended. There were a lot of contradictions, which Xenophon himself highlights by pointing out how Greek laws and customs regarding pederasty, the relationship between men and a boy, differed across states. Many laws were put in place to protect young boys, the future of the polis, from disenfranchisement and the corruption that they believed came from being placed into a submissive role, which disqualified them from becoming citizens. You see, the concern among citizens, particularly Athenians, was not the male-on-male -male nature of the relationship per se, but the protection of young boys for the future of the city. As a submissive boy subjected to sexual competition for honour of his adult male, as a submissive boy subjected to the sexual competition for honour by his adult male pursuer, found himself in the role of a woman. And young boys in the role of a woman could not be trusted to uphold a strong polis, as this was not a woman's forte. So there's something here about the making a boy a woman argument, and Cohen goes into that. Cohen argues that being an object which was desired, courted and receptive within sexual intercourse was considered a passive role, and passivity was a woman's nature, not a man's. He backs up his claim by highlighting how Xenophon refers to the hubristic practice of using men as women, and Plato arguing that the man who adopts a passive role in homosexual intercourse could be rebuked as an impersonator of the female, a situation which was regarded as against nature. By the time he wrote Laws, Plato concluded that homoerotic relationships were against nature and should be banned for the ideal state. Yet, interestingly, there's no evidence that any of his contemporaries or predecessors shared this view. In contrast, Xenophon presents Hieros, or Hero's love for the youth, Dialocus, as seemingly driven by the needs of human nature, and many passages in Aristotle accepts pederasty as part of life. We have another quite interesting contradiction to the idea that queer love was not acceptable in ancient Greece, as there was well-documented notion of honour being bestowed upon men who succeeded successfully courted young men. Well, how can this be? I mean, surely the shame of being the passive young boy would reflect upon his male pursuer. 
Well, this is why it's all complicated and not so clean cut. So Cohen argues that honour existed in polarity to shame. One could not exist without the other. The pursuing lover, known as the Erastes, gained honour in his success and shame in his rejection. Yet his success came at the defeat of the Eromenos, the person who is pursued. For, according to Pausanias in the Symposium, it was shameful to gratify the Erastes. Put a pin in that argument, we'll come back to that because there's a misreading here. But anyway, Cohen argues that one man's honour came at another man's expense, and this agonistic sexuality couldn't manifest when pursuing a woman, unless she was married, and then there could be a cockold. But such courtship came at a risk to torture, mutilation, and death to the pursuer should a man attempt to woo a woman who was married to, I don't know, a talented soldier. You see, unmarried women were not courted in ancient Greece as they were married very, very young, so young boys were perfect for sexual competition of honour in ancient Greece, according to Cohen's argument. However, in response to Cohen's paper, Clifford Hindley stresses his doubts about Cohen's readings, asking if this meant that sexual relationships between Erastes and Eromenos were generally regarded as necessarily shameful to the younger partner. Hindley argues that Cohen completely misreads Pausanias' claim in Plato's Symposium that it is shameful to gratify the Erastes, because the full quote reads as such. For these, pandemian lovers, are men who have brought the reproach into being, with the result that some people go so far as to say that it is shameful to gratify an Orestes. You see, the full quote in context demonstrates that Pausanias clearly did not share the view attributed to some people, nor, it's implied, would the majority of Athenians agree with this. When discussing the Enconium, Aristotle details how Harmodius and Aristogiton were the first people to have a statue erected of them in the Agora at Athens in honour of them having slain Hipparchus and his brother Hippias, who together had exercised tyrannical rule in the city towards the end of the 6th century BCE. As Hindley writes, Harmodius and Aristogiton were lovers, Erastes and Eremenos, and their exploit was frequently referred to by later writers as much in celebration of their relationship as part of inaugurating the era of democracy, an unbefitting response to a society seemingly riddled with shame over homosexuality, as Demetrius would claim. To suppose that homoerotic intercourse was inconsistent with the pursuit of goodness in ancient Greece, Hindley argues, would be to import Judeo-Christian morality into an alien context. As Boehringer and Cacciagli explain in their paper, The Age of Love, Gender and Erotic Reciprocity in Archaic Greece, attraction between individuals was not based on categories that we would consider today, such as gender, but on their status as a free person, or those outside that status, such as enslaved people, foreigners, aliens, etc. I say all this knowing it would be too much of an oversimplification to say that there was a general acceptance or unacceptance of homosexual attraction in ancient Greece. As Hubbard points out, in Greece, quote, suspicion of homosexual relations of any sort seems most pronounced in those genres of discourse that were designed to appeal to the masses' resentment of socio-political elites iambic poetry, comedy, forensic oratory, and popular street preaching, end quote. Okay, so homoerotic lovers were frequently satirised, but is satirization of a subject enough to constitute a claim that the subject was unacceptable in a culture? Well, I would argue not, because none of our world politicians would be in power were that the case. And interestingly, it would seem that from the evidence of the satirization of homosexual or homoerotic relationships, particularly between men, it was due more to the elitist status of these relationships rather than the nature of the attraction. After all, the association of pederasty was with upper class venues like the symposium and the wrestling school. And that suggests in of itself that it was an upper class phenomenon. And as Hubbard points out, at least in Athens anyway, only men with a certain amount of wealth leisure and education were in a position to provide boys with the attraction and courtship gifts that they might expect, whether tangible or intangible. So, with that out of the way, let's get to an answer of the other question here. Did Alexander the Great like men, or did Netflix make him gay? In his book, Curtis described Hephaestion as, quote, by far the dearest of all the king's friends. He has been brought up with Alexander and shared all his secrets. Okay, so whilst there is no evidence that the two had a sexual relationship, 
there is also no social cultural evidence to suggest they would not have. And it's convenient that we don't have any evidence because we have extensive sociocultural evidence that cultures following the Macedonians would have deliberately censored any explicit reference to these two being lovers, had there been any. So it is understandable why we don't have any evidence, but let's talk about why people assume that they could have been. We've already discussed in the last section about the idea of submission, and due to the attributes towards submission and implied femininity, many scholars have argued that bisexual erasure occurred not only in later writings of Alexander, but in ancient ones. Because whilst it was very common discussions of pederasty being somewhat known about in Greek and Macedonian cultures, Alexander's possible relationship with adult men was not considered a-okay regarding the ideas of submission and femininity. You see, Hephaestion uh, was allegedly taller and much more handsome than Alexander, and that in of itself would have made the great leader the submissive and the feminine in the position. And naturally, censorship of such dynamic would be intended to conceal such submissive femininity from the great leader. And why do we think there's been censorship? Well, Hephaestion was Alexander's second in command, yet he is strangely absent from many instances where he should have been referenced, and many ancient historians give vague verbiage around their relationship. What we do know is that this. The pair likely began their friendship during their adolescence, while Hephaestion was employed as a royal page to Philip II. Hephaestion was implied to be of noble heritage, with his father being part of the king's inner circle. Hephaestion was one of the boys selected by Philip II to go to Mysa, uh, a remote west side of Pella, to study under Aristotle with Alexander in 343 BCE. And Aristotle, as we know, supported the social tradition of pederasty. In his politics, Aristotle wrote, quote, the lawgiver has devised many wise measures to, to secure and benefit the moderation at table and the segregation of the women in order that they may not bear many children, for which purpose he instituted association with the male sex. So whilst we have no proof of such a relationship between Hephaestion and Alexander, ancient texts and comments made within them not only sometimes suggest an intimate relationship between the pair, but they also comment on a notable lack of interest in woman on Alexander's behalf, with his own mother concerned that he would never father an heir. We see in Athenaeus 435a, quote, Olympias, Alexander's mother, actually sent the outstandingly beautiful Thessalonian courtesan Calexina to bed with him, he being Alexander, and Philip abetted her in this, for they were concerned lest taking precautions lest he might should be a gynus. Olympias frequently begged her to have sex with Alexander. So in his book Alexander of Macedon, Peter Green analyzed this extract, stating that Quote, both Philip II and Olympias were worried by the boy's lack of heterosexual interests. They feared he might be turning out to be a girlish invert known as a gynus, and frequently begged Alexander to have intercourse with this woman, which did not suggest great enthusiasm on his part. Historian Robin Lane Fox described the relationship between Alexander and Hephaestion quite frankly, quote, Hephaestion was the man whom Alexander loved, and for the rest of their lives, the relationship remained as intimate as it is now irrecoverable. Alexander was only defeated once, the cynic philosophers said long after his death, and that was by Hephaestion's thighs. Athena Richardson covers the relationship between Alexander and Hephaestion in great depth in her essay, Alexander the Great and Hephaestion, Censorship and Bisexual Erasure in Post-Macedonian Society. She points out that Alexander famously visited Troy in 334 BCE, a trip which has been viewed by many as an act of pothos by Alexander, with his deep connection with the hero Achilles. Roman author Elian described the visit in his various histories, noting how, quote, Alexander crowned the tomb of Achilles and Hephaestion that of Patroclus, signifying that he was as dear to Alexander as Patroclus was to Achilles. Now, obviously, this quote leads to the separate debate about the nature of the relationship between the mythical Achilles and Patroclus, one which has been bumped into limelight thanks to novels such as The Song of Achilles. The reason people apply a homoerotic relationship between Achilles and Patroclus is the notification of such a relationship being insinuated in Plato's, which later likely inspired the Greek statesman 
Eskenes to employ the two in his own speech, regarding them as lovers. Eskenes said, quote, I will speak first of Homer, whom we rank among the oldest and wisest poets. Although he speaks in many places of Patroclus and Achilles, he hides their love and avoids giving a name to their friendship, thinking that the exceeding greatness of their affection is manifest to such of his hearers as are educated men. Richardson explains in her essay that the purpose of the speech in 346 to 5 BCE was to publicly accuse a man called Timachus for being unfit to involve himself in public life due to misconduct while serving as the ambassador to Philip II. Eskenaz aimed to distance the image of the chaste Achilles and Patroclus with the accused Marcus, whom Eskenaz disparaged as, quote, wanton and overcome with by forbidden lusts. These charges included prostituting himself to male clients, in which Timarchus was said to be the submissive beloved. Although no proof was provided of Timarchus's selling himself, he was punished by disenfranchisement. This case study can be used as an example as to why later writers were probably inclined to erase any suggestion or reference to Alexander's bisexual nature, or what we would class as bisexual today. There are more documented mentions of possible male lovers of Alexander. According to Quintus Curtius Rufus, the last Archimenid ruler, Darius III, reportedly had a young eunuch lover named Begoas, who was presented to Alexander the Great upon the ruler's death. Begoas is not discussed in the Alexander narrative of Arian, or even that of Diodorus Siculus. However, according to Curtius, Begoas was an influential lover of Alexander and supposedly manipulated the new Persian king into executing the worthy Persian noble Auxene. Due to only being mentioned three times in surviving ancient sources, many question the legitimacy of Begoas' existence. But scholars are less interested in whether the eunuch truly existed and more interested in the purpose of his supposed existence in Alexander's story, with the themes of bad kingship and the supposed oriental corruption of Alexander being associated with him. Men in Macedonia were not expected to choose their lovers based on gender, and as such, even the term bisexual for Alexander is redundant. As Richardson points out, our contemporary identity politics, particularly around sexuality, is regressive in comparison to ancient times. Stigmatization around Alexander's alleged male lovers revolved around his possible status of being submissive rather than a lover of men. Whether or not Netflix made Alexander gay can never be denied or verified, because the connection the two shared died with them several thousand years ago and is completely inaccessible to us, not only textually and empirically, but inaccessible to our very understanding of language regarding love, attraction and sexuality in ancient Greece. We will never know. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for Sophia for sending the requests and th I'm always open to requests down below. This is quite fun. I haven't done a history essay in a wee while. All the references that I've mentioned in the video are linked down below with other resources if you're interested. Thank you to my Patreons for making this possible as well. And I will see you soon for another video. And remember, books save lives. So keep reading. Oh, I have such a stuffy nose and it's hurting so much. It's like itchy, itchy. Why is it itchy? I can't breathe. I can't speak. I can't even hear myself speak. I must sound insane in this video.